Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our municipal series where we sit down with local elected officials from across this great country to talk about themselves, their community, and of course, their duty to serve. Today on the show, we have Timmins Mayor, and I'm going to make sure I pronounce this correct here. I've written it down phonetically, so I'm going to get it right here. Timmins Mayor Michelle Boileau, your worship, Very welcome good. to the show. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to so- be here. Well, before so let's get the party started with the question I've asked every single elected official and anyone aspiring to be elected. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from, Your Worship? Well, it's a good question. I think it's uh, part of it is just innate in me and it always has been. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I just have a very empathetic personality. It's uh, something that I've always sort of done growing up. I always enjoyed volunteering. Um, always got involved with different community groups and in that, at school, especially. Um, I had forgotten until I, I first decided to run for municipal politics that I was actually on student council, you know, in high school and I was the at the head of the student council in high school towards the end. And so I guess it was always something that uh, um, that I was drawn to without it being intentional uh, necessarily. And um, after university, I went to go volunteer in Guatemala, you know, work for NGOs and, and schools there. And so it's, it's just something that... Uh, but I guess I, I feel driven to do and, and it gives me my sense of purpose. Was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up or was it something that you grew into as you aged? Um, my dad definitely always encouraged <laughs> us to follow politics. I was probably the only one of my uh, sisters, <laughs> one of uh, four girls and the only one that actually, uh, you know, was paying attention. And, you know, he encouraged us to read the newspaper in the mornings with him and things like that. Uh, but he was an accountant. My mom well, worked for him as a bookkeeper at his firm. So it was mostly accounting talk that was happening at the dinner table. <laughs> but I think, uh, yeah, my dad definitely uh, encouraged encouraged me to stay you know up to date with current affairs and um I suppose yeah we, he and I do and always have had uh, those kind of conversations so I want to go back to the very first election for you because we all remember we always remember our first time being on the ballot being on the sign and putting your name forward I remember in 2010 when I put my name forward and I can still remember the day walking into that ballot box and putting an x or a check mark beside uh, my name for you in 2018, was there an issue in Timmins? I'm assuming that's the first election you ran municipally from what I can fig- find on through my research. Was there an issue in 2018 that you thought, okay, I need to address this and I'm the best person to address it at the council table? Or was it outside influences, people saying you should put your name forward in 2018. What was the decision in 2018 to finally put your name forward for elected office? Yeah, I don't think there was one issue per se. Um, I was working for community college at the time in uh, as a liaison officer. So I worked in recruitment and, and kind of community partnership development. And um, so I was attending a lot of the events, the community events and uh, sitting on committees and, and boards and things. And I guess the more engaged I got in the community, um, the more I started following what was going on municipally and in, in terms of uh, municipal governance. Um, there was a bit of, I guess, turmoil among council at the time, a lot of debate, a lot of conflict, uh, some division, um, and a lot of the talks surrounded a big festival that had taken place two years in a row and that was costing us a lot of money that the city was running. And so that seemed to be the focus of every conversation, every council meeting, Um, you know, it was causing it was creating a bit of a circus, you know, people were getting kicked out of council meetings and stuff. And the whole time, I mean, this is 2018. So we're still seeing, you know, the opiate crisis was looming and coming. Uh, Homelessness rates rates were increasing. And, and for the first time ever in in my city and my region, really homelessness was starting to become visible. Um, And so there's all these other, you know, social issues that I felt, you know, being engaged at the community level that, we should be talking about we needed to be addressing and it just wasn't happening I wasn't seeing it um and I was also starting to you know brush shoulders with our municipal councillors and and so often I would just think well 
I could do their job, <laughs> you know, so maybe I should. And I guess one night I was just having a dinner party, you know, we're at a friend's house. And I guess after a few glasses of wine, I started talking like that. I could do that job. And what are they all doing? And a friend really encouraged me to, to think about it. She ended up printing out the nomination papers. By the end of the night, I had sent, you know, seven to 10 signatures. She went next door to her aunt and uncle's house to get them signed. And um, so the next morning I woke up and thought, maybe I'll see where I could take this, see if I could get the rest of the signatures required and how people react, you know. Um, and the rest was history. <laughs> you, you seem like you have a pulse on the community. You, from what you were just saying, you talked about the social issues that were going on in 2018. That first campaign, when you were out door knocking, when you were engaging with the, your potential constituents, if elected in Ward 5, were there issues that people were talking about that you didn't think you would ever hear at the door or was it like you said the opioid crisis was it that festival was it that ongoing stuff or were there more local issues that even as someone engaged as yourself didn't expect to hear when you went door knocking no i i wasn't so much surprised by what i was hearing um again you know our local leadership wasn't talking about these issues um necessarily and so i was mostly hearing about you know, need for better recreational facilities, uh, new arenas, a new swimming pool, which was a lot of what had been talked about around the council table as well. So uh, focus on that festival and, you know, a lot of questions about uh, if elected, would you or would you not kind of continue on with that and stuff. So, you know, I, even at the doors, I wasn't hearing the concern that I felt was warranted, right, at the time. Wow. And so, um, again, it was, it was just motivating me that, you know, that I had to, I had to get involved and, um, and not to say that, you know, all this light was brought to, to, to these issues and attention was brought to the issues just because I was elected to council or anything, but, uh, um, some of the other councillors that were elected at the same time, you know, were taking the same approach. Um, we're doing it for those reasons for that, you know, with that, that will to try to change things for the better. So. So in 2018 on election night, they declare you the next councillor councillor elect for the city of Timmins. What's the first thing that goes through your mind the moment that check mark is beside your name, the moment they've uh, declared you a councillor elect? Well, the, <laughs> the first thought that went through my mind was. Um... I guess disbelief that my parents didn't think that I could actually do it. <laughs> no. yeah, just because they commented that they were like, "Wow, you 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 actually got this. You got this." As we saw the numbers coming in, and uh, so they were a little surprised. I was a little disappointed by it, um, but uh, understandably so. I was young, and you know, just uh, really at the beginning of my career and stuff. But um, no, it uh, it felt good. I was I was pleased with the results. I wasn't expecting. Um, to have the second highest votes, um, you know, following only another early 30s uh, female woman of color. So, you know, it was really pleasing to see um, the level of change that, that happened at council. And um, it became obvious that people wanted to see more diversity, you know, uh, a more reflective council. And we were hearing some of that during the campaign as well. So, um, it just reinforced that, like, this is what people want to see, just some, and we were hearing that, young blood, you know, fresh faces, um, so that that was really obvious after that, uh, those, that first election night. So after that first election night, then you get your training, but then you get the honor that so little people get in your city to walk on that council chamber's floor as an elected official. Now, I've asked this question to every single municipal politician and federal and provincial politician. What is that moment like as an elected official walking on? Because the weight and responsibility of your community is now on your shoulders. The decisions you make affect their pocketbooks, affect their families, and affect their day-to-day -day lives. How much of a weight did you put on your shoulders to make sure you were prepared and informed about the issues that were going to be presented in front of you? Yeah, I, I didn't take it lightly. It was um, it, quite powerful. We're, you know, we're piped in. There's uh, bagpipes that lead the, the procession. So, um, you know, there's a, there was a lot of symbolism and a real sense of ceremony. And so um, it, it, the seriousness definitely became real just in that moment, in that inaugural meeting. Um, and so, you know, I... I felt that I, it was important to be prepared, like you said. So, you know, every day 
since I've made sure to read all the reports, to, to ask the questions before council meetings, to go in informed. Um, and it, and it's, it hasn't gone unnoticed, right? It's, it's, it's appreciated by administrative staff that you work with. Um, it's, I've come to realize that working for a city is probably one of the hardest jobs because I guess in any level of government, you know, kind of working in those governmental departments must be so difficult because you can't plan beyond the four year cycle or the right, whatever the election uh, cycle is. And so um, really, really taking into consideration the recommendations coming from staff and, and trying to support them in their planning because, you know, they try to do long-term planning and, and, and just being cognizant of that, that, uh, um, you know, they're, they're trying to do it mindfully. So, yeah. Does, does that, that change? Only... Does that change? Because when you, you were elected in 2018 as a councillor, in 2020, this last election, you were elected as the mayor of Timmins. So does, does the idea that you need to be prepared change to I need to be over prepared because now the councillors who were just elected who are I, I'm sort of leading the city with are looking to me to have these sort of questions answered before we get into council so that way they I can help them navigate their issues or their concerns that they may have with a report or an issue that's in front of council. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really takes a good sense of um, being able to anticipate uh, what might come, what questions might be might be asked, making sure that if I don't have the information, you know, it will be available. Um, so definitely, I, I've been, you know, I feel a sense of responsibility. I'm privy to a lot, you know, a lot more. I sit in a lot more meetings and and have more conversations that councillors do. Councillors are working part time in our city. They all, all, but actually most have full time jobs that you know they have their own commitments to and stuff. So um, I try to. Uh, make sure that I'm, I'm sharing, you know, that relevant information, that there's a lot of information sharing, um, and just that counselors know what I'm working on, who I'm meeting with, giving them that, that opportunity to ask questions along the way so that they don't feel um, caught off guard or bombarded, you know, at a meeting when all this information is being presented. So um, definitely a different sense of duty because now not only um, are you, you know, working and representing the residents that that have voted for you, but uh, I definitely have more of a responsibility to provide that kind of leadership for council as well. So um, but it's, it's been pleasant so far. <laughs> so far. Um, you talked about the part time aspect because um, municipal councillors, and I'm not sure as mayor if it's a full-time job or a part-time job in Timmins, but you are mayor of the city 24-7. You go to the grocery stores, people will know you who you are. If you're an MPP or an MP, you're in Toronto while working. You're in Ottawa while working. Yes, you have Constituents Week, but as a municipal politician, you're there 24-7. Have you struck the balance between private life and mayor life yet or is it still because it seems like you're an engaged person like i said you you want to be able to take those questions at the grocery store or when you're sitting down at the restaurants but i can imagine that gets a little burdensome from time to time as well yeah yeah and i mean i'll admit that it I, I don't go unrecognized in our city. <laughs> I, you can't tell sitting down, but I'm also six foot two. So I'm a tall woman that, you know, people recognize me even during, our, you know, I would joke that even when we had to wear masks going into the grocery stores and stuff, and most people would kind of go unrecognized. I said, no, I, there's no going in front of you when you're as tall as I am. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, I would get it a little bit before too, but uh, people have been very respectful since uh, since I've been elected. Um, I do get get stopped and usually it's, you know, good, good, good questions or concerns, but um, no, people have been respectful of my time and I have a young daughter. She's, uh, you know, two and a half, not quite three yet. And, and so often when, when people do approach me, it's just to kind of ask about that, you know, meet my daughter and just congratulate me. And I, I I've been saying that we're probably still in a bit of a honeymoon phase, a honeymoon period right now, <laughs> but, uh, but it's been, it's been fine. And I mean, it's, it's important that I be able to hear from, from residents directly from residents about the things that are affecting them the most, you know, often uh, it'll just be someone wanting to, to just mention that uh, a transit schedule, you know, for the route that they depend on could be enhanced, could be, you know, improved on and things like that. So it's all still really important things, but uh, yeah, so far so good. <laughs>
Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years. And to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own and often on a case by case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. I want to turn to the city of Timmins as a whole now. And before I ask this question, I want to preface this because we seem to get, always get emails whenever I ask this question to municipal councillors. And that is, this is an opinion of the mayor talking to the host of the cross-border interviews. This is not emotion at council. This is not a policy at council. This is her opinion. So your worship, Mayor Below, sorry, Boileau, I will Michelle get that. Uh, Michelle. Yeah. Um what, in your opinion, is the biggest issue facing the city of Timmins today? Hmm. I mean, there are a lot of concurrent issues, um, so it's hard to say that there's just one. Um, but we are definitely, definitely feeling the impact of the opioid crisis that I know is, is a national problem. Um, but uh, in 2022, we were actually had the, the, the second highest uh, rate of overdose fatalities related to opioids um, per capita. Uh, we also have one of the highest rates of, of homelessness per capita. So we're you know, um, superseding the cities of Toronto and Mississauga and the Hamiltons, the province, like we are, we are right up there and above. Um, and so for a small city of just over 41,000 people, um, you know, we're, of course, a, a bit of a service hub for the region, for northeastern Ontario, um, people from communities as far north as uh, the James Bay Coast. I don't know how well you know your ge geography in Ontario, but uh, a lot of... Uh, originally from see. Ontario, so I know your area oh, okay. quite well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so a lot of people have to come to Timmins to, to yeah. access different services, right? Healthcare services, social services, um, uh, justice services, uh, court appearances and whatnot. So um, there are a lot of people coming through Timmins, but um, we don't have the resources and the supports that were required to to be dealing with the issues that we're facing now um so it's it's difficult so we're doing a lot of building having to build the you know the system the structure and build the support these kind of things so um that's definitely i think that the main issue uh, would be the opioids um so uh so you talk about yeah. building that infrastructure how how is council doing that because you talk about opioid and uh, homelessness, houselessness uh, being a big issue in your area. But I, I will be blunt here by saying those sound like federal and provincial issues, but as municipal councillors, as municipal leaders, you are stuck with the sort of the handholding and trying to figure it out for your community. So how are you addressing those issues at council? And I know as of recording this, you're about to go meet with provincial uh, representatives, if I'm not mistaken. So are you addressing these with your provincial counterparts and are they listening? Yeah, um, they are listening. We have engaged uh, partners at, at both levels of government at this point, which I think has been a result of, of the advocacy that we've had to do over the, the past few years. And so I'd say definitely um, just throughout my last term and, and um, we've been successful in, in bringing attention to how, how grave the issues are here. Um, we've been able to uh, open safe beds and emergency withdrawal beds in our hospital. Uh, we have a, a really great team, innovative, proactive team at the hospital here, which is a district hospital. So um, it's, you know, it's serving the wider region as well. 
Um, we've seen, we had opened an emergency shelter uh, over the last term. Um, we also, as a municipality, have fully funded a temporary safe consumption site or consumption and treatment services site um, to be able to get a temporary location up running to seek uh, federal exemption and, and ultimately provincial funding. Um, so uh, we're putting in the application tomorrow or, or Monday, and uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to start receiving provincial funding for that. But as a municipality, you know, we recognized that we couldn't wait. Um, you know, we had to go through the processes and the applications and, and working with the uh, provincial and federal partners. But in the meantime, we had to do something to stop people from dying on the streets. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of, of our, our, our municipal leaders for stepping up and, and making those, those tough decisions. So, um, and we've also implemented a lot of upstream initiatives, a youth wellness hub, uh, it opened its permanent location this past year. Um, we've focused on uh, coordinating services, uh, ensuring food security. So, you know, we've got all the different uh, community agencies together to make sure that there's, you know, at least one, if not two solid meals being served across the community every day of the week. Um, so it took a lot of coordinating and just working together and essentially, like I said, just realizing there's no one's coming to our rescue and, you know, we just had to work together to start solving some of these problems. On average, how often do you have to deal with provincial and federal issues from constituents? Because they don't care if you're a municipal leader or a provincial uh, politician or a federal politician. They have elected you to address their concerns. How often would you say that residents are coming to you with federal or provincial issues? Because it's a common theme that I'm hearing from a lot of municipal leaders that municipal issues only come to them when it's their water not getting turned on or their garbage not being picked up or there's a pothole. In Timmins, is it the same? Is Are people coming to you with federal and provincial issues that you have to try and solve as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, things like uh, just costs of living and, you know, the cost of gas at the gas station. And um, so like you said, all things that are not necessarily within our purview, um, <laughs> but people look to us to try to, you know, deal with. Um, so probably most of the time. Yeah, I don't keep count, but we get a lot of it. But that's okay. Like we've got pretty good lines of communications with our provincial and federal representatives. So I'm always happy to, you know, even if it's just forwarding a message to, to have it in, you know, our MPP or MPs mailbox. Uh, it's something I could do, right? So. Now, my last question in this segment before I turn to my last segment is, um, you talked about the issues that you believe are important to the or that are the most pressing to the uh, city of Timmins. But if I go ask 100 people in your community, they're all going to have something different. They're going to talk about a playground that needs upgrades or a pothole or a sidewalk that, that needs to be fixed. How do you as mayor balance that? Because you have to look at the city of the as a whole, but you also have to remember the people who've elected you. So as mayor, how do you address individual issues while also looking at the, and I'm going to quote Spock from Star Trek here, how do you, the needs of the many outweigh the, outweigh the needs of the one or the few. So how do you do that? How do you look at Timmins as a whole, but also remember that there are individual issues that are out there that people need addressed? Um, it's like you said, it's a balancing act. I, you know, I don't want to say luckily because of course these are, you know, very serious issues and, and, and tragic issues, but most people are talking about community safety, housing, really? and just general well-being of the community. Um, it's something that comes up every day that we hear and, you know, not just myself, but counselors, uh, as well as, you know, kind of agencies such as our Chamber of Commerce and our, our downtown BIA business improvement area. Um, they're all hearing about, you know, the need to improve community safety and, and well-being. Um, that being said, you know, and, and luckily a lot of these one-off kind of asks or, you know, concerns from, from residents um, can, can, you know, end up being related to community self safety and well-being and things like, you know, recreational facilities and, uh, you know, better programming and things like that all contribute to the overall well-being of the community. So um, usually, you know, I could I could help them draw the link between that and our community safety and well-being plan that we're acting on. And and, uh, you know, it yeah, it becomes apparent to every resident that we're working on it and we're, we're taking every idea, you know, into consideration and, um, you know, we've committed to re reviewing our recreational master plan. So, you know, we're, we're doing a bit of some strategic planning to see how we could take all these different ideas and, uh, um, you know, needs and wants of the individual residents and, and turn that into 
something we could actually act on and move forward with. That's great to hear. I want to turn to my last segment now because I'm cautious of time here. And that is my favorite one because as a tourist, I like to visit communities and I like to know what tourist hotspots I should be visiting. So in the city of Timmins, Michelle, what are some of the hidden gems that people, if they're visiting, which this summer we're taking an RV and crossing Canada. So we're going to be stopping in Timmins to see what you are about to say. So what spots should we be stopping in, in as a tourist to your community? Oh my goodness, there's so many <laughs> gems in the air. And I'm sure every mayor says that about their city. But um, I mean, we're in Northeastern Ontario. Um, you know, we're the largest city in the region. So it's it's quite vast here, uh, quite, you know, rural and remote, but uh, in Timmins. So you have access to a lot of the natural assets, right? So a lot of walking and hiking trails. Uh, there's a river that goes right through the city. So if you like paddle sports, kayaking, paddle boarding, canoeing, you could do a lot of that in the area. Um, and there's also, if, if you say you're coming throughout the summertime, a lot of festivals, uh, farmers markets, um, uh, indigenous uh, festivals, powwows, uh, different First Nations host powwows uh, throughout the region. So, um, you know, you can kind of hop onto the powwow circuit and see what's going on there. Um, and, and then, of course, in the wintertime, we've got downhill skiing and, and cross-country skiing and snowshoeing and snowmobiling and all those fun kind of winter activities that um, that you could do kind of just right from your doorstep. So that's nice. But then, you know, we, we have the movie theater and restaurants and uh, a, bit, a bit of a nightlife as well. So you get you get the best of both worlds. We actually have um, a good corporate partner, Newmont, uh, which is one of the mines here, who has an open pit operation right in the center of our city. So that's that's probably unique and you'll wanna look for some Google images. If you look at City of Timmins, you could actually see some aerial shots and it's it's right in the middle of the city. So uh, <laughs> when we say that Timmins is a city with the heart of gold uh, because of the gold mining that happens here, it's, it's literally right at our heart, but they've actually built up on the berm, uh, built a, a lookout so you could drive up to this beautiful lookout that, 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 they've, uh, that they've built there. And you could either look down into the open pit and watch the mining operations and the rock trucks going around, or you could have a, this great like landscape view of the city and in the horizon so yeah it's it's quite neat so a good spot where you can kind of just bring a lunch up and go enjoy the views and watch the mining trucks go by and my daughter I, loves it <laughs> i'm so, i'm certainly gonna love it this summer but what about yourself yeah. though a after a stressful day at council after a long day of work where do you go? And you can't say your house because a lot of mayors and councillors always want to say, I go to my house to decompress. Where in the city do you go to decompress? To decompress? Yeah. You like, is there a park? Is, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give a shout out to Full Beer Brewing, uh, Full, Full Beard Brewing. Um, so that's a bit of a watering hole for, uh, you know, an after work drink. Um, but, uh, you know, this weekend I'll be going to the ski hill. My family and I do snowboarding. So, uh, yeah, we go out and enjoy the, enjoy the winter because winter's along here. So you have to get out and do some of that, you know, even just walking the trails in the winter time with the dog is pretty awesome. Um, dog sports have become quite popular, uh, recently. So dog powered sports. So, I mean, that includes, um, like dog sleds, but also, uh, people do cross country running, um, biking, um, with, with their dog on a, on a, a harness, uh, kind of pulling along. And, uh, so yeah, so kind of mountain biking, but with dog powered. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, I haven't gotten that adventurous to get on the back of a bike being pulled by a dog. Um, but we got a harness for our dog. So he started pulling, we put him to work when we go for walks and he pulls the sleigh that my daughter sits in. So that's kind of neat. Um, my last question before we wrap up is, what makes the city of Timmins such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, what makes it unique, I think, is this kind of meeting of, you know, three different cultures initially, um, and then it's becoming just a mix of this beautiful richness of cultures with the new waves of immigration coming through. But, um, you know, it's got, it's got the steep history um, in, in French culture, English culture, and Indigenous cultures. And so you could really see how they all kind of marry here. And so 
it's really unique because um, um, we've all had to learn to live and survive together, right? So there's this, uh, and I'd also say just the resiliency of the people, um, uh, especially the First Nations peoples uh, from the area. And so, um, you know, really being able to see their culture um, alive here, it's vibrant, uh, it's present. Um, and uh, and I say French and English because the, the city of Timmins is actually about 50% bilingual, um, the residents here. So um, it's uh, it's unique in that sense that there's this like a tri-culture that's, that's ingrained in, in the foundation of the city. You've painted a vibrant picture just in that statement of your community and I'm so looking forward to getting back to the community this summer I have been to your Timmins a few times and I'm looking forward to visiting again as a tourist this time and not as a Ontario staffer for a right. minister at the time so um you see hotel rooms and meeting rooms oh, exactly. case, right? so we'd be happy to take you out and show you around <laughs> um your worship I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and sitting down and talking about yourself and your community. Uh, I look forward to visiting Timmins this summer, and I look forward to potentially meeting you this summer if you have time for a quick hi or a quick coffee. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Please reach out. Let me know when you're coming through. I'd be happy to uh, uh, spend a day with you touring around. Awesome. So with that, as I remind everyone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody because it helps our society, it helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people. With that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.